last week we, um, we took our first step in following the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is a quest that's going to take us along these things that's called parables. And the reality is, is that there are eight parables. So we're looking for the kingdom of heaven. But to find the map, we're going to use eight different parables that we're going to, find, that we're going to use. And so you have to ask the question, what is a parable? And we spent a lot of time last week trying to help you understand a parable is nothing more than an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It is a story that Jesus told so that he would have an, an object or a visual image so that we could understand what he's trying to get there. Now, I want you to know that how you've studied parables in the past isn't exactly how we're going to do it now. We're going to follow a very simple outline. You see, we are not going to assign a value to every single item in this parable. When we, when we look at these parables and we begin to talk about these stories, the tendency is, is we want everything to have a meaning. Well, that's not what we're going to do. We're not looking for everything to have a meaning, and we're also not looking for some deep, hidden meaning. A lot of times when we study parables, we, we overthink it. We just make it too complicated. Like there was some little nugget of information that only I can ascertain if I put all the pieces back together. Well, that's not what we're doing. See, we're simply going to do what I like to call the vowels of understanding a parable. We're going to observe the story. That sounds cool. You know what that means? It means we're going to read it. We're actually going to read the parable. We're going to explain the context it was told in. Now that's important because you have to remember these stories were told 2,000 years ago. Their culture is much different than our culture. And so some of the things that are told, the only way to really understand what's supposed to be going on is we have to go back and look at the culture that it was told in. We're going to understand the, assemble, the symbols that have meaning. Now that's okay. There's a lot of symbols in these things, but I want to tell you the ones we're looking for. We're looking for where is God? We're going to look at the story and we're going to find out where God is in the story. We're going to look for what represents the kingdom. Now all these parables start out, the kingdom is heaven is light, but there is something in this parable, every single one of these parables, that represents where the end state or the process of the kingdom is. And then we're going to ask the most important question for me and you. Where are we? When I look at these kingdom of heaven parables, I want to find myself because if I find myself and I know where the kingdom is, then guess what? I can figure out how much further I have to go before I understand what the kingdom of heaven is. After we understand the symbols, we are going to identify the kingdom principle. Now, by that means is that every single one of these parables has a theme. Every single one of them has a lesson for us to learn. It is going to be a certain principle that we are going to look at. And then if we're going to identify the theme, we've got to make it really important to us. We're going to apply it to our lives. We're going to make some kind of application for me and you today. Now, this is important because these parables were not told so that you could make an application tomorrow or the next day or the next day. I should be able to take something from this parable that I can apply today to my life. So let's start where we said we we're going to start. If you have your copy of God's Word, will you please turn to Matthew chapter 25. If you don't have a copy of God's Word with you, since we don't have the slides behind us today, if you want to look in the pew rack right in front of you, there is a, there is a black pew Bible there. You can open up to Matthew chapter 25. That's going to be where we're going to be the entire time. And I am going to attempt, no hard biblical names here, so I'm going to attempt to read verses 1 through 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like, like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish one took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took the oil jars and along with their lamps. The bridegroom was long in the time coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, a cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come out and meet him. 
Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish ones said to the wives, Give us some of your oil, and our lamps are going out. No, they replied. They may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were, while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready and went, and went with him to the wedding banquet and at the door was shut. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour, the day or the hour. So if my video had worked, we were going to have the song. Every wedding has this song. It's the moment when the lady in white steps back there and they open up the doors and they hit the first chord. And what's the name of the song? Here Comes the Bride. Well, that's not the name of our sermon. Our sermon is Here Comes the Bridegroom. Because this particular parable, although we're going to stop by a wedding, isn't focused on the bride. It is focused on the groom. So to fully appreciate this parable, I, I got to take you back in the time machine. We got to go back a few thousand years and we got to understand that, well, weddings just aren't the same as they are today. They don't make weddings the way they used to. Marriages were arranged. And by the way, the older my kids get, the more I'm thinking arranged marriages is a good idea. <laughs> Let me pick. You know, my son's like, no, I don't think so. But marriages were arranged sometimes at birth. So that means sometimes, you know, you were born and maybe your, your neighbor had a kid too and the parents would work out the deal and your entire life you were set up to marry this person. It doesn't matter what they grew up to look like. It was a contract. You were going to marry that particular person. And because of that, it was very possible that the family you had and get you were engaged to, maybe they moved or maybe you moved or you weren't in the same area, but it is very possible that the groom... And the bride had never physically seen each other. How would you like to have that? This is where the idea of the veil comes from, that you don't see the bride on the, on the wedding day until after she gets down the, down the, down the aisle. But, but you've seen your bride. I mean, come on, we date in our society. We, we've seen the people that, that we marry. But just imagine you're the groom and you're standing there and they're doing it. Here comes the bride and you have no idea what she looks like underneath the veil. Yeah, wouldn't that be an interesting ceremony? But here's the thing. Weddings were not a ceremony. They were a celebration. As a matter of fact, we had it backwards than what they had it in the, in the biblical time. In the biblical times, they partied first and married later. Okay, If you think about it, we've seen this picture before because we look back on our wall of faith. We, talk, we met Jacob and Leah, and they had the party first. And after everybody was a little drunk, um, then they got married, and it wasn't a celebration, and it wasn't a ceremony. As a matter of fact, at the end of the party, the marriage ceremony where the bride and groom got together. You can ask me a different time what that means. I'm not going to talk about that right now. But the bride and groom would, would get together and consummate the marriage, and that's how the wedding went. So, so you've got to get that picture, because it doesn't work the way that we're used to seeing weddings work where we all sit in nice little rows and columns and the bride walks down and it's more something we look at. Weddings were a participative thing. It's kind of cool. Now the other thing we got to understand is the idea of the virgins. There were ten of them. And the closest thing we could compare these two in our society today is a bridesmaid. Now, they were called virgins in the parable because in biblical times the assumption was these were unmarried ladies and therefore they had never participated in sex, so they were virgins. That's what the term means. And if they were probably friends or maybe even family of the bride, but they had one job. They were to meet the groom at the city limits and escort him to the wedding. You're probably thinking, that's kind of weird. Well, remember, a groom probably may not live in this city. So the groom knows how to get to Stanton, Virginia, but has absolutely no idea how to get to Stanton Church of Christ. So he just gets to the city, and it was the job of these ten ladies to stand out the city limits and wait for the groom to come and then escort him to the wedding. 
Remember, he has no idea where he's going, and there are no GPSs at that point. You also have to remember that the groom isn't traveling by car, plane, train, probably by foot, or if he's rich, maybe a donkey or a horse. Therefore, when the groom would arrive, you didn't really know. You had a ballpark idea. You know, they had the intention of when they were going to arrive. How'd you like to be the bride on that day? You know, you're, you're sitting there and you know he's on the way, but you know, you don't know, did the donkey have a flat tire or did something else go wrong? You know, you're sitting there wondering, is he going to show up? Is he going to turn around halfway there and decide not to honor the contract and then there's going to be a whole big court battle going on? You, you just don't know. So the, the bride is where she's supposed to be and the groom is on the way, but you don't know when he's coming. As a matter of fact, he may arrive at nighttime. And there are no street lights. So guess how they're going to get the groom from the city limits to where they're supposed to be going? They've got to have something to light the street. Guess what they had? Each lady was given an oil lamp. Actually, she was supposed to have her own. It was a ceremonial lamp. If it was a nighttime wedding and the groom arrived, they would light these lamps so that they could illuminate the street for the groom to get from the city limits to the wedding celebration. That's where we're at. That's the scene that Jesus lays us out. Now, while I had to spend about five or ten minutes explaining this to you, you have to understand, everybody there would have known exactly what Jesus is talking about. He said, yeah, the ten ladies waiting by the street. Yep, 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 been there. My daughter got married last year, and these are the ladies. That, it would have been a great picture for them. But now you understand. That's what's going on here. And so with that background, I want to understand the obvious symbols that we're looking at. Where is God? Well, that's a pretty easy one. He's the groom. He's the one that's coming. He's the one that everybody's waiting for. He's the one that is the important central figure of the wedding. Again, you see how the culture has flipped? On our wedding day, who is the important central figure? It's the bride. wasn't so in biblical time. It was all about the groom. So, so everybody here is waiting. So that is God. So what represents the actual kingdom in our story? Well, that's the wedding celebration. That's the, the end state where everybody is trying to get to. That's the party that everybody is talking about. And that brings us to the third question. Where are we? I mean, where am I in this picture? Who am I when I look at this particular thing? Well, and that, that depends on who you are. You see, we can identify two groups of people as we look at this particular story. We have people already at the celebration. Now, these are people that knew where the party was. These are the people that knew roughly what time it was supposed to start. These were the people that were getting a head start on the buffet line and the mixed drinks. These were the people, they were already there at the party. And I hate to tell you this, that's not us. Okay, That's not us. As a matter of fact, the closest I can come to that is maybe people that have already gone on to meet the Lord and they're now there in heaven or they're there now wherever the party is and they are awaiting the coming of the groom, but they're already where they're supposed to be. Their journey is over. They're done. But there is something important you need to know about them. They're still waiting on the groom too. They still see the coming as a great. Even though they're there at the party and they got their spot reserved, they've already picked out their table, they make sure they're close enough to the food, but far enough away from the people they don't want to sit next to. You know, they got their early to stake out their spot. Even though they are still looking forward to the groom. That's not us. We haven't reached our final destination. But that's okay, because there's a second group of people that's mentioned in this particular parable, and it's the virgins or the bridesmaids. Now, like the people at the wedding, they too are also waiting on the arrival of the groom. 
they are waiting for them and they're sitting there and they're sitting there in the heat and they're waiting and it starts to get dark and the sun goes down. They get a little tired. They get a little sleepy. They're like, okay, is this guy going to ever come? Did they take a wrong turn? Somebody, want, got, somebody got a cell phone. We'll give them a call, see what time he thinks he's going to be here. Who knows what they were thinking, but there they were, these ten ladies. And you know what? They were still in the world. They weren't sitting in a nice air-conditioned building or however they cooled their buildings back then. They weren't there undercover. If it was raining, they were getting wet. Okay, They were still out there doing the work. They were still out there waiting for the groom. But you know what? They still had a job to do. They weren't there to party and celebrate. They were there because they had been given a task. They had been given the task of lighting the path for the groom to make his final arrival where he was going. Hmm. Maybe this is us. Now, if it is, with inside of that group, there were two different kinds of people. Jesus called them wise and foolish. So, to identify the principle that we're looking for here with, with this particular parable, we need to understand this parable is really part of three parables. If you look there in Matthew chapter 25, there are actually three parables told. And we have those nice little sections and headings that the publisher puts in for us. Just so you know, for Jesus, this was all one story. Jesus told the same story in three different scenes. There's this one. Then there's the parable of the talents. We're familiar with that one. That's the one where the master's going away. He gives everybody some gold. He says, hey, go out and invest it for me. I'm coming back. When I come back, we're going to settle up accounts. And it doesn't go so well because, you know, one per two people do what they're supposed to and one person doesn't. We'll get to the parable in a minute. That's the parable of the talents. Then there's also the parable of the sheep and goats right there in 25. And that is where Jesus comes back. The king comes back and he looks at the flock and he says, well, you're the goats and you're the sheep. And he decides... Who's in and who's out? All of these stories were told together. Each of these parables had the same theme. We're waiting for somebody's return. Each of these parables, the arrival was uncertain. Didn't know when it was coming about. Each of these parables posed the same problem. Some of the people were prepared and some were not. In the parable of the ten virgins, the ones that we've been looking at this morning, half of them were ready and half of them weren't, right? In the, in the parable of the talents, two of them were ready and one was not. In the parable of the sheep and goats, we don't get the numbers. It doesn't tell us how many sheep and how many goats. But it was, what it does tell us is that there were definitely two different groups. Those that were prepared for the coming and those that weren't. Just so you know, each of these parables have the same ending. Those that were ready, they were allowed to live with the master. Those that did not were cast into a place that caused the weeping of gnashing of teeth. Very distinctive. You see, these parables, they're all about end times. They're all about the ending of the kingdom. They're all about the thing that's right there at the end. The king is back. The groom is back. The person we've been waiting for is back. And so this is what happens. And you need to understand that this kingdom, these kingdom parables, the principle you're looking for is, are you prepared for the kingdom? That's what God is trying to help you understand. That's what Jesus is asking. Are you prepared for the kingdom. Now, we're going on vacation in a few weeks, and vacation is something you have to prepare for. You got to make reservations. If you're not going to take your own car, you got to book a car. You got to figure out how much money you need so you can go do the things that you want to do. You got to figure out what clothes you're going to wear so you're going to go to the things that you do because you don't want to dress too hot, you don't want to dress too cold. You just want to be It takes a lot of preparation. I have never seen anybody, this is the day of the day before, that says, I'm going on vacation, and just gets up and gets in the car and starts driving. Okay, Bud and Patty did. <laughs> and that's kind of scary. Remind me, never go on vacation with Bud and Patty. So, so we have this idea that this is something you get prepared for. Well, the kingdom is like that. Jesus is giving them three stories to tell them how to get ready for the kingdom. Now, I bet I've got your interest, because wouldn't you like to know? 
How do I get ready for the kingdom? What is it I'm supposed to wear? What is it I'm supposed to pack? Well, we can look at these three stories and we can come up with three different things that you need to ask yourself. Are you prepared for the kingdom? And the first thing I want to know is, from the parable of the virgins, do you have a light? Now, note the question is not, do you know what makes light? That's not the question. It is also not, well, do you know where to find light? That's not the question. It's also not, can you borrow a light from somebody else so that you can have a light? The question is, is do you personally, individually have a light of your own? What do I mean by that? John chapter 8, verse 12 says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but whoever but, but will have the light of life. Do you have a light? Do you have Jesus? Do you know who Jesus is? Have you accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior? Have you followed him? Do you have a light? Because if you don't have a right, the next two steps are going to mean nothing to you because we have to answer that question first. For you to be prepared for the kingdom, you have to have your own individual light that you can use to light the path. Not moms, not grandmas, not the preachers. Your light. Do you have it? If you do... We can move down to the parable of the talents. And I can ask you this question. Are you busy serving? We are pretty familiar with this parable. I kind of gave you the big, the big story as it. You had the two servants that were serving their master while the third, third just simply hid its resources. The guy that hid his resources, the master called him lazy. The master called him wicked. So, to prepare for the kingdom, God wants to know, are you serving God with the resources you've been given? Now, I, I don't want you to miss it. Because the idea of, are you serving? If you're not serving, guess what? It was the same ending of the story as the person that was not prepared because they had no light. They ended up in the field of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this is not to say we earn our way to heaven. This is not to say that we have to get on some service contract to, to make it into the kingdom to find God. But what it does say is that if you have no service in your life, if you have no intention of serving God, then you have to go back to question number one. Do you really have a light? Because if you have a light, then the idea is that you use that light to serve what does it say in Scripture? That we don't hide our light underneath a basket. We put it up on a, on a stand so that other people can see it. We understand the purpose of a light is to light a path, to light a room, to light our life. And so I have to be busy serving if I am going to be prepared for the kingdom. So what about the third question? This is a very troubling parable, that third one, the parable of the sheep and goats. Because the goats thought they had it right. They did. When they were identified as goats and not sheep, the goats got pretty upset. They said, we don't understand. We don't understand. When did you put up these requirements? What are you talking about? You see, because the question from the sheep and goats is, I want to ask you, are you ministering? Now, Again, I don't want you to miss it. At the end of the sheep and goats, the people that were not ministering met the same, people, met the same fate as the people that were not serving, which is the same fate of the people that did not have a light. Jesus makes no distinction between the three. So I can only come to one conclusion, that is if I have a light, it's going to make me want to serve. And if I begin to serve, it's going to make me want to minister. So the question becomes is, what's the difference between serving and ministering? Well, here's the difference. If we are serving and we only serve ourselves, that's not kingdom ready. You see, in this parable of the sheep and goats, it became all about who are you serving? Who are you ministering to? Jesus gave some specific examples. 
He said the poor. Those that were hungry and naked. He said the outcast. Those in prison. He said the needy. Those that are sick. These are the people that Jesus identified and said, take care of them. That is ministry. And if I'm not interested in ministry, then I have to go back and ask the question, am I really serving the right master? And if I'm not, if I'm not serving the right master, then I have to go back and ask the base question, do I really have a light? Do you see how this preparedness connects together? It's not the fact that I have to have some big ministry to thousands and thousands of people, but the idea here is that if you have a light, you will serve, and if you serve, you will minister. That's just the way it works. Not my words. Jesus' words. Jesus had this idea that if you are finding the kingdom of heaven, this is what you will see. You'll be prepared. So here's my question for you today. If today was the day that the chord on the organ was struck, da, 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 here comes the groom. Are you ready for the wedding? Are you ready for the groom to come back and say, I am here. The party is about to start. I am back. I have arrived. We can go ahead and get on with the next phase here. Are you going to be like one of these foolish virgins? Are you going to say, oh my gosh, he's really here. Uh, oil's out. Somebody, some, I need a light. Can somebody give me a light? You understand. It's too late at that point. Because it's not your light at that point. Are you going to be like the guy that was there and he had been laying on his, his couch waiting and all of a sudden he hears the king's trumpets coming. He's like, oh my gosh, I made no money whatsoever. I served nothing. And so he ran out and all he could do was dig up the treasure that, Jesus, that, that the king had given him and say, I give you back what's yours. And he says, that's not good enough. I gave it to you to invest. Are you going to be like the goats who just kind of sit there and say, when were we supposed to serve? When were we supposed to minister to these people? And Jesus said, you understand, if you did it to them, you did it to me. Are you prepared for the kingdom? Now you know how to get yourself prepared. It's up to you to decide what you're going to do with the message. I can't force a light in your hand. I can't force you to serve. I can't force you to minister. In all three parables, it was a choice. Not even going to attempt the slides. What number is the hymn? It's in the bulletin for me. Just in case, we haven't used them in a, little long, in a long time, but those little red books in front of you, those are called hymnals. And there's a hymn number there. And if you can just tell us what number it is, we're going to take out the hymnals and we're going to do our invitation time the old-fashioned way. <laughs> so would you please stand? 399? 399. Would you please stand? We're going to pray, and then we're going to sing.